Good morning, guys. Welcome to Costa Rica Real Estate and Investments. Today, we're going to be discussing digital nomads. So I thought I'd put on my digital nomad shirt here. We'll be talking with Brandon James, head of sourcing for Outsight, a company that creates co-living spaces and communities for remote workers all over the world. They have properties from Bali to Tulum in Mexico, and most recently, one here in Santa Teresa, Costa Rica. Remember, if you have any questions for us, uh, or future guests, please ask them in the comments and remember to subscribe. Let's get started. Good morning, Brandon. How are you doing this morning? Good, Richard. How's it going? Good. As I said, I mentioned I put my digital nomad uh, shirt on here. It's the best, <laughs> the best one I had. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I mean, the digital nomads is kind of a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Quite a few people are talking about it. Um, I, you know, I'm not a digital nomad myself. I've lived here in Costa Rica for 16 years, so it's not as if I'm trotting all over all over the world. But I suppose essentially it's people that can work from wherever they want to in the world. Yeah, yeah, correct. And um, more so it's uh, kind of uh, people aren't even moving around at this point because they're already digital, just uh, how the work scenario is working out. But um, yeah, I mean, it started about 10 years ago in 2010, I'd say during the last financial crisis. Um, and it started with bloggers, um, basically selling ebooks, you know, about living the lifestyle. Some of them added a lot of value. It was more about philosophy and kind of, um, buying back your life by, you know, taking money from a set location and kind of working with currencies and, you know, uh, currency arbitrage was a big thing, making money in the U S and then going to uh, somewhere in Latin America where it's cheaper. Um, but yeah, that's evolved and mutated so many times since then. And even this year, it's gotten to a whole new echelon in terms of uh, what's possible as a digital nomad. So it's cool wow. to say. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I was speaking to someone about it the other day that it was like, you know, a lot of people, the old way of doing it was, well, I suppose it's not the old way because some people are still doing it, you know, but kind of in my father's era, it was you wait till you're 65 to go and live the dream, if you know what I mean, of moving and living on the beach here, you know, kind of to an extent here in Costa Rica, whereas... Nowadays is with remote working and working from home, you can kind of really combine those two things together. Yeah. So I actually, I used to work in finance and right. I, my approach was I saved a bunch of money and then took off on my first trip. So that was kind of little training wheels to get into the lifestyle and the Thanksgiving dinner before I leave, everyone's kind of clamoring about my trip and talking about it. And Carl, the kind of elder of the group comes up to me and he's like, you know, that's something you do when you retire, when you're like 65, like, what do you think? <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm retiring when I'm 22 now. So uh, it's a kind of a new, uh, Tim Ferriss calls it a mini retirement. You kind of give yourself these little breathers for three months at a time. But you know, if you're a web developer, um, a creative director, even in finance at this point, you can do your job online and um, yeah, set up your life to, allow you to move to anywhere and, and work from anywhere. So. That's awesome. I still hope to at some point to be able to be working a couple of months a year from the south of France, but we'll see where that we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> yeah, now, how, how, how long have you been with how long have you been with outside? Uh, so four years now, I wow. moved to California. And actually, I was on a trip in Brazil, uh, messaging with the founder who I had been friends with from my previous startup. And he was like, do you want to join us? Um, you can stay in our house in Venice when you come to LA. And I needed accommodation. So, <laughs> you know, that was probably the end of my like savage nomad lifestyle where I was yep. really picking up and leaving whenever I wanted. With outside, I travel a lot with the company, but um, I've kind of divided my life between LA and the road before I literally would move every three months, which is common. So that's why outside's pretty handy for our members because um, they, you know, need a home base and um, most of them don't have that. So every new city they arrive in, outside is their home base and the community is already pre-established and it's all like-minded type people. So uh, yeah, four years. Um, previously, I had a company in Austin that was uh, servicing the local market there, um, Nomad, so it's called Nomad Pad. And yeah, basically just like two founders talking over Skype about the industry and it eventually led to the job at Outside. So wow. it's uh, yeah, definitely a small community. Everything happens for a reason, right? Absolutely. Con connect the dots backwards. So explain a little bit about what, uh, I mean, briefly, I'm sure some of, the, some of the listeners in here are kind of, you know, they're kind of getting an idea of what Outside is, but give us an idea. I mean, I think a lot of people have heard in Latin America about, you know, kind of Selena Hostels. Um, which I think is, a, is, is 
different. Well, I think it, it not think it is different than outside, but maybe you can give us an idea of what outside is and what it does. Yeah, so we're a next generation hospitality play. Um, I'd say the main difference is we can kind of adapt to a lot of different property types. Um, we've done villas, we do boutique hotels, multifamily, bigger developments. So yeah, we work with developers, boutique hotel owners, um, smaller vacation rental operators. And um, yeah, we basically have a member only community. So that's a big difference between Selena. Uh, people pay to be a part of outside and get access to our Slack channel, which has big community of uh, really, you know, informed digital nomads and growing uh, with uh, kind of the recent uh, media bump that we've been getting. Yep. But um, uh, yeah, it, uh, it basically activates properties from Bali to uh, Tulum. So we're in really key destinations for where people want to travel. And we really get feedback from our community of where we're going next. Um, we're really like from the beginning building for the community. We um, started on a, a channel called uh, Nomad List, which was actually a Slack group. It, was, right. it had like uh, kind of a member gate to join. And it was like about 3,000 people in the beginning, all really like dedicated location independent professionals. That was kind of the original term that never stuck, uh, which is surprising because digital nomads a lot more, uh, has more pizzazz, I guess. Yeah. But um, yeah, from there, it was literally just a group of forums and people trying to figure out housing, trying to figure out insurance, you know, like, um, you know, traders, um, people starting businesses completely remote, um, like Buffer, which is a really successful social media um, app that like kind of similar to Hootsuite, totally remote team was started over Nomad List. And um, yeah, what the founder levels, uh, that's like his kind of hacker alias is one of our advisors. And um, yeah, so it's been, you know, from five years ago till now, and you know the, uh, the the more recent work from home kind of orders have really like steered a lot of people in our direction because before you know they had to have awkward conversations with bosses about working remote and now they're forced to. So, <laughs> but uh, you know we've been always catching up with demand. Um, it's always uh, there's a lot more people in the industry than there is properties uh, yep. that can do short term and kind of the specific uh, type of management that we we asked for. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, I do uh, expansion at Outsite, and my job is like finding that sweet spot for the community and for property owners uh, to make sure everything works out. So, yeah, because I was, I was turned on to you guys by a friend, someone who just mentioned, you know, hey, take a look at this Outsite property here in Santa Teresa, Costa Rica. So I took a look at it. And I was like, wow. And I think I reached out to you because we uh, have an eight bedroom villa in, in, in Guanacaste, and then we got talking, you know. Uh, and I got really interested just because I was like, this sounds awesome. You know, it sounds like, you know, if I wasn't married, had two kids, uh, you know, and, and had my own, my own company, you know, it would definitely be something that I'd probably jump into, even though you'd probably say, Hey, Rich, you can still probably do it, you know, yeah. uh, even like this. <laughs> but I, mean, I mean, it's people, people have nomad for weeks at a time, you know, it's like do little introductory trips. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I think the the real dream is full time on the road, which yep. is probably only like thirty percent of our community. Um, but yeah, I mean, at this point, you really don't have to fully commit to the lifestyle. Like when I started, it was like all or nothing, you know, <laughs> like quit my job, start a blog, like that type of thing. But uh, yeah, now I mean, I've been at home this past year basically, and I could have been on the road, but I just kind of uh, I've hung my travel hat up for now until uh, I get the vaccine. But, you know, there's uh, tons of people that are traveling and it's actually, you know, similar to having roommates. It's basically just as safe, especially with local cleaners and, and just kind of our standards of how we kind of um, approach COVID in that situation. So we've also kind of steered away from doing shared uh, rooms and shared bathrooms. Yep. So, um, yeah, like it's always evolving and uh, definitely like end suite units and uh, you know, giving that privacy while having that community, it's uh, definitely uh, where the industry is headed. And I think it works great in tropical kind of lifestyle destinations like Santa Teresa, yep. because the co-working element can be <clears throat> kind of open air where, you know, the rooms are private. Um, so when, when people are kind of joining together, they're not like in some confined space 
which uh, I think people feel more comfortable with now. So. Okay. Well, I mean, you mentioned there that, you know, you're typically looking for boutique hotels, larger villas. I mean, I, I know that you guys would like to do some other stuff here in Costa Rica. I mean, for people listening in at the moment that are like, well, you know, I've got a boutique hotel or I've got a villa. I mean, what kind of stuff are you looking for um, just mm -hmm. to kind of let them go let them think, okay, yeah, my property would work and I should be getting contact with you or it probably yeah. won't work. Sure. So I'd say our minimum threshold for a new location would be 12 rooms, yep. like very bare minimum. And that really depends on the quality of the property, location, layout. So there's, again, like a lot of considerations for co-living. Um, we like to build a co-working space, whether it's commercial or just for the residents of the, each property. So yeah, whether it's the lobby or if there's some, you know, office areas that can be converted, uh, that's always great. And then, yeah, most of our clients aren't with cars. So, I mean, probably similar to hotel guests. So really like prime location, walkable to cafes. Um, and, you know, right now with the pandemic, there's just so many local brands and it's really hard to differentiate with all the deals that are out there. Yeah. So this is really an opportunity to like, mainline into that community and you know attached to a global brand and kind of just going into like how we work as a business um we're a license agreement typically with boutique hotels uh, we, we operate too we've that's our kind of history is operating um you know starting from scratch and really furnishing out the spaces and and doing everything from a to z uh, but now we're more partnering with existing operators that might be struggling that, um, you know, could use like a little higher ADR since they've really like bottomed that out, trying to attract customers. In Santa Teresa, for example, we're at like 90% occupancy wow. at a healthy ADR and wow. it's more extended stays. So people are staying like three weeks to three months. So it's, um, yeah, it's a different kind of class of, of, um, of customer. And it's, it's um, I mean, not, not to talk about Selena, but it's more of a professional customer. We're not really uh, like the party uh, brand, you know, people will, you know, grab drinks after work, but people will come to outside really to get stuff done. And that's like the big differentiator. We're, we're work first and then stay. Um, so yeah, in terms of like activating a community of people who are doing what you want to do if you're trying to become a digital nomad, or you know finding people to grind with or you know add new employees it's it's all possible with outside so yeah it's uh it's a really cool intersection again it's specific and i think that's why we survived up until now and are continuing to like thrive in some locations during the pandemic san francisco new york you know those are <laughs> to be determined but those were hot locations two years ago so it's it's really like and actively managed and actively kind of, um, uh, you know, you got to stay on the, the pulse. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, again, you know, there are a variety of different locations here in Costa Rica. Um, yeah. You know, you guys are currently only in Santa Teresa. I mean, are there some areas in Costa Rica that you guys are particularly looking at or that, that are hot on? Yeah, I mean, Santa Teresa has always done well, but now it's just like gangbusters. So. Yeah. Um, we definitely would love more in that city. Um, yeah. It's definitely hit like a critical mass in terms of purchasing. It's probably prohibitively expensive, but if there were any boutiques that were interested in co-living and, um, and you know, it's co-living is, uh, that's like kind of an old term. It's more extended yeah. stays for remote workers. Um, but we're looking in uh, uh, Manuel Antonio. That's, uh, you know, in terms of like, finding remote destinations that still have the infrastructure. That's really what it's about. And Costa Rica has a lot of beautiful locations like Uvita and, you know, places that are, might be more suited for more luxury, um, you know, type of combination that you run at Namu. But um, yeah, we're, we really need to find that intersection of like affordability with infrastructure and, you know, not too remote where people have, you know, have to cook at home every night. And so. I mean, how much would someone be looking to in, invest and how does the business model work with you guys? Because I, I, I remember when we spoke, there was talking that there would have to be from a design element, you know, side to bring it, you know, you guys have kind of like a theme or a feeling that you guys like to go with. Um, I mean, 
you know, because I know there's going to be questions there of like, how much, is, how much am I going to have to invest in order to be, you know, become part of outside? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, in the best case scenario, it's a hotel that they're already kind of looking to upgrade yep. and then they bring outside on and we're kind of the design consultants and, you know, we're very specific. We're building a brand. So our head of design, Danny, she's an architect. She lives in Venice, Italy to draw inspiration. Wow. Like, wow. So she's very committed to, uh, you know, keeping those brand standards high. And, you know, it's, it's an investment, but it's also a long-term, you know, value add to the property. It's a very clean palette that the design uh, would eventually be. And the outside branding, it's, it's very minimal. It's like wall decals and stuff that, uh, you know, down the road, if they convert back into being a normal boutique, it would still function just as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we try to look for hotels that are more clean slate where, um, you know, that branding already is needed. Yep. Um, and I mean, with a totally empty hotel where there's no furniture, we say around 5,000 a bedroom. Um, but that's also, you know, to kind of equip it for extended stays. So that might include like adding kitchenettes to the unit or, um, you know, better bed sheeting, like just, just stuff that makes it more feel like home than a traditional boutique hotel. You know, some, I know some uh, setups on, you know, like an $80 ADR hotel uh, can be very minimal. So if that's what we're presented with, um, there might be quite a bit of investment, but it's never major and it usually will increase uh, occupancy because we can actually change the layouts and try to get more rooms out of the space. Um, we just opened a, a boutique under a license agreement in uh, Toto Santos and the owner is building out more like bungalow style units. So, you know, we work together and try to add as much like rev generating space, but also, um, you know, definitely adhere to the brand standards that outside's built itself around. So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting concept and I, I, I'm sure that, you know, the listeners are, you, you're probably going to get quite a few contacts from this. Um, you know, I, I, again, I'm sure one of the big questions though is, is am I going to make money with this? Because I'm sure that you guys are going to, you know, you guys are going to take a cut of the income coming in. But as you yeah. mentioned there, I mean, your Santa Teresa property is at 90%. I mean, yeah. with just and a yes or no answer, would you say that the Santa Teresa property makes money? It's currently making money for sure. Okay. So much so that the owner is building out uh, four more bungalows. Wow. Um, yeah, in the development. And there, you know, it's, that's a great property because it's a developer who has those capabilities to like instantly prop up new structures. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the way the, like, you know, with, with initial CapEx, that stuff gets depreciated, you know, on the balance sheet. Those are investments that hotels should be making anyway, every five to 10 years. Um, in terms of us operating under a license agreement, we take 20%. And that includes OTA fees. Um, so basically, uh, you know, Airbnb takes 15% right now just to list on their website. So we're not a listing site, you know, we're a, we're a brand. We're basically like applying a, host, a hospitality brand on top of um, the existing structure. Um, so yeah, we're, you're basically getting a full suite marketing um, you know, some light management. We have a community manager local who uh, coordinates with guests and maintenance people and, uh, you know, makes it a lot easier on the operator to run. So they're freeing up time, which is, I think, the biggest sell for a lot of, uh, a lot of investors and business owners. Um, so, yeah, I'd say, um, and then, yeah, that, with the occupancy currently, you know, it's definitely a much better option than high turnover uh, tourism, which has really taken a hit, whereas, you know, we're kind of moving in the opposite direction in terms yeah. of demand. So, um, yeah, and, you know, even pre-COVID, um, we've, like, completely targeted the remote workspace. So, in terms of, like I said, our demand growing more than our supply, we've always hit really high occupancies. And um, it's, uh, you know, it's just a lot lower run in terms of expenses, there's no turn down service, you know, so mates are a lot cheaper, uh, cleaners, and um, there's just less wear on the property than traditional hotel guests. People kind of have a sense of ownership 
with outside properties, our members, um, you know, if they're staying for three weeks to three months, it's uh, basically their, their home at that point and they want to maintain it. So, yeah, I mean, again, the first time that I heard of outside and then when I started digging in, I was like, this is a really cool concept, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, are you typically, I mean, typically people that are using outside, I mean, cause you mentioned it was member based there, meaning then, you know, it's, it's, I mean, and that's really smart because I yeah. think from the point of view of, you have this membership database that again, if somebody does set up, you know, partners with you guys, you know, they have instant access really to that, you know, to those members. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, that's a huge, huge benefit. Uh, I mean, who, who are the typical guests? I mean, if you were to just kind of, you know, just give us a, a brief, I like, I suppose, overview of, of your members. I mean, how would you describe yeah. that? Yeah. So, I mean, we have our kind of marketing archetypes, like remote Richard, you know, yep. um, you know, there, it's a pretty affluent demographic, honestly, the, um, people are typically don't work for themselves. They typically have a high paying job that they've negotiated in remote. Yep. So that was kind of a pre pandemic. Um, and it, it still might apply when people start going back to the office because there's going to be a divide of people, you know, willing and unwilling. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, we have investment bankers who are working from the road, uh, advertising executives, um, people that run businesses, obviously. So I'd say like the target, like income or average income of the demographic is like 80,000 a year, yep. which is really high when you're considering, you know, the locale like lisbon or mexico um and yeah i would say probably 60 percent on the road 40 percent at home um which is you know important because when they go back to their hometown it's kind of like sharing stories from the road and it's you know usually about what who they met in out in the outside or you know like yeah. what unique experience happened in an outside so yeah word of mouth marketing is definitely great for the brand um and then what, what, about, what about like age range, would you say? I mean, again, not to be, yeah. able, I mean, which tip, what, what are typically the age range of people coming? I take it. It's not really families. It's typically going to be more individuals or couples. So, yeah, I mean, we're not a hundred percent set up for families, you know, yeah. like we're not really like if, if, uh, you know, a family with a newborn came to the space, it would be a little interesting, but, um, yeah, yeah some locations have studios where it's a fully separate unit with a kitchen and then, you know, they can integrate elsewhere. But I mean, there are definitely, you know, so many use cases. There are people that have, you know, gotten divorced and now they're kind of on their own and figuring out a new lifestyle, kind of reinventing themselves, you know, people who are selling their home and they need like, it's just, this is like, a very new type of real estate and it's it's not there's not a lot of um options for people that aren't trying to commit to a you know a year lease yep. but also aren't you know staying just wanting to stay in a hotel room with no people that they know you know like typically if you're staying in a boutique hotel uh you really have to like put yourself out there to meet people whereas when we take over a boutique hotel we're turning it into like a very homey experience that is an outside and you know, the community manager facilitates those interactions. Um, but we have couples. I mean, we, um, we have, uh, yeah, I mean, people that are fly completely solo, people that are traveling with friends. Um, so yeah, it's, we try to accommodate to everyone because it's definitely like a very uh, egalitarian kind of community. You know, it's, that's the whole kind of idea of um, being a digital nomad is you're a global citizen, right? So yeah. it's all about every culture is accepted, every, you know, type of lifestyle. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's again, a lot of balls to juggle, but we try to accommodate. Um, and yeah, I know there are co-living companies that are like gung ho about family and really committing to that. Yeah. And I think it's a great idea. Cause like when I was traveling back in the day, there was a, um, a family that rode across the world on tandem bicycles wow. with their two sons on the back. <laughs> so, you know, anything's possible. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I, I thought taking my kids to Europe for six months and traveling around, taking a sabbatical was wild, but yeah. <laughs> tandem bikes, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, j just listening, you know, I mean, I think that the, you guys have a perspective because you opened two of two of your first properties yourself. So I think you understand, you know, the pain as well, you know, oh, as, yeah. as very similar to me is, you know, 
with my business, we, we own a hotel, we also have a travel agency, so we can kind of both, we see both, you know, both sides of the picture. It's not, you know, we have a, a, um, a unique perspective that not many people have. And I think that you guys have that as well. And I'm sure that that plays into when you partner with a property. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, being an operator, it's, it's not easy. We got no. it. <laughs> so we're trying to kind of uh, ease those headaches and use technology and, you know, our platform is kind of the main sell just as that grows, um, being kind of the source for remote workers to find accommodation. It's like our main goal. So Awesome. Well, I mean, if people are interested in getting in contact with you, I mean, like, I mean, if they want to be members, uh, I mean, what, yeah, I'll put everything in the, in the description, but sometimes, you know, people just, uh, you know, that are listening to this. I mean, what's the best way to reach out to you guys? Yeah. So outside.co is kind of where everything is housed um and then my email just shoot me an email brandon at outside.co b-r-a-n-d-o-n and i'm you know always online always ready to get on a zoom wow. call so yeah. please yeah please reach out um i'm not traveling as much as i used to but i also wouldn't mind taking a trip down to costa rica or mexico to kick tires uh, <laughs> funny story uh, we're in in uh, Santa Cruz at a local bar near Pleasure Point, which was a neighborhood where we had a property, and it, we were sitting around hanging out. And uh, Emmanuel, the CEO, kind of jokes that um, they sent me or they asked me to go to Nicaragua, and I literally snapped my fingers, and like four days later, it was down there, you know? <laughs> and uh, no hesitation, you know. And I uh, I had never been to Central America. Uh, at that point and uh yeah it was just like in the jungle in a rental car like lost you know <laughs> like not even thinking about what I was doing so um yeah I mean I I kind of have a addiction to that type of adventure of just being like totally out there totally lost so I'm kind of perfect for this role of like scouting properties around the world but um it's been way more effective doing it like this just face to face on a zoom call with hotel owners so yep. I mean, we can do, you know, in terms of them showing me the property on a call or me just getting on a call and like answering whatever questions they have. Um, yeah, I'm always available. So awesome. Yeah, I'm sure. So listeners, please reach out to Brandon so that he has an excuse to come to Central America and especially. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, I tried with Emmanuel the other day when, when we spoke. Right. I, I he was protecting me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, my last question I like to ask everyone, Brandon, is if you inherited 500,000 and had to invest it in Latin America, what would you do with it and why? Mm. I would probably just, I actually a little bit about the current environment and also just my own personal preference. I'd probably buy something in Medi in Colombia. Yep. That was the first city that I went to that was like a really crazy adventure while working in uh, finance. <laughs> and my crazy friend who had like been to Papua New Guinea suggested it. And days before the flight, all of our colleagues were showing us like kidnapping articles about <laughs> Americans who got kidnapped in Colombia. And then I show up and the whole, it's a complete opposite experience. Is, like the is, most yeah. beautiful people, amazing infrastructure for the digital nomad lifestyle. So it's always been a hub for remote workers and nomads, but currently it's not really target because it's a little sketchy with COVID. So I think there's going to be some real estate deals there that we'll appreciate over the next five years. And once everyone's vaccinated and like free to travel to any country, I promise you that's going to be like white hot. So. Yeah, I agree. I've been to Colombia quite a few times and it's, it's been heating up, you know, and especially Medellin as well. It's so cosmopolitan. Uh, right. Yeah. It's, you, know, it's, you would be surprised. Like yeah. that'd be jungle, but it's, uh, it's amazing. Or another one would be uh, Puerto Escondido, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Super good, cheap deals there, and everyone's going there. So that'll be like Santa Teresa in a few years for sure. Wow, wow. Well, Brandon, thanks again for uh, giving us your time and uh, yeah. giving us all this information. And again, as I meant, as I said, I'll put all the contact details in the description. Um, and thanks again, and hopefully we'll get you on the podcast again soon, buddy. Absolutely, Richard. It was fun. Fantastic, man. I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Talk to you.